Hey guys, welcome to our service. I'm so glad that you're tuning in today. If you didn't know, Church on the Move is a family of churches. We have three locations across Northeast Oklahoma. So if you live near one of our locations, come out and join us in person. We have incredible worship and teaching, and of course, amazing environments for kids and students that we want you and your family to experience for yourselves. If you have questions, you can drop a comment below or visit churchonthemove.com for more info. Now enjoy the service. Well, healthy correction is almost impossible when it's outside the context of healthy relationships. It is almost impossible to bring healthy and helpful correction to someone when you don't have a relationship with them. Because when you're not in relationship with someone, and I know you're really smart, and I know that you've had all the great experiences in life, and I know that, that you know all the answers and you know all the right things, and you should probably be given just a t-shirt that says, I should correct you. I should put you in your place. I, I know that. But nobody else does. Okay? And when you're not in relationship with someone and you step into their space, you step into their life, you step into their circumstance and think, you know, I'm going to help this person not be so stupid and I'm going to bring some correction into their life. It doesn't come across as helpful or healthy correction. When, when you see someone at the grocery store and they do something that's a little off and you, you just step into that space and think, I'm going to, I know your heart's right. I know it's pure. I know your motives are good. You don't have any attitude, any pride, any arrogance at all motivating you, but you step into that and you bring some correction. It doesn't come across as, as helpful. When, when you're on Facebook and you see someone make the dumbest, most moronic, idiotic post, and you think, bless their little hearts, I'm gonna help them just grow a little bit today, and I'm gonna bring some healthy, helpful correction to them. And you step in, and you write the most beautiful soliloquy of correction and adjustment to them. It doesn't come across as helpful or healthy. It actually instead comes across as an attack. Because there's no relationship. They don't know you. They don't know your experience. They don't know your motive. They don't know your background. There's not been the work to cultivate a healthy relationship that says, you know what, I really care about you. I really care about your life. I really care about your relationships. I really care about how, how things are going for you. And I, I just want to help you be a little bit better. It doesn't come across that way a few years ago. I uh, made the mistake of bringing correction where there wasn't relationship. And it, it, back, it, didn't, it backfired. It, it, it wasn't good. Um, because listen, when you feel attacked, let's, let's be honest. When, how many of you have ever experienced correction and it, and it felt like an attack? It felt like someone, okay, thank you. I'm not the only one in the room. Um, when you feel attacked, there's like one of three responses that you can step into. There's the silence. It, you're, you're like a turtle that goes inward and just hides in your shell. And you just shut down and you just try to survive the attack. This person's attacking you. I don't know why they're coming at me like this. And so they just, you, you respond in silence. You just shut down. Um, early in my marriage, this was kind of my defense. I would, I would shut down. I would just go inward. I would just go into my shell. And you just try to survive. The second, if it's not silence, some of us respond with violence. And maybe not physically, but when we feel attacked, it's like, oh, no, 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 you don't. No, let, let, okay, let's go. You know, you, you think I'm stupid. Well, I'm fixing to show you how you're stupid. Um, you know, and, and so we get into this violent exchange and all of a sudden you've seen the heated conversation. You, you have seen it get physical. I mean, there's just crazy things that can happen when people feel attacked. And here's, here's why this happens. The third one is avoidance. We just run from it. We just get away from it. It's like, if I can just, you're, you're like a road runner. You just get out of here. You're just running from the problem. The reason that is, is because of the way our brains work. Our brains were hardwired in the beginning to view everything in life through the filter of threat or reward. Is this something that's a reward 
Or is this something that's a threat? And when we view something that's a reward, we move towards it. It's like, hey, that's a great animal that, that looks like I could get a nice T-bone steak out of that thing. And I'm going to move towards it. I'm going to kill it, skin it, eat it, hang it up, let the meat cure. And mm, man, we're going to have dinner tonight. On the other hand, when we see things as a threat, we've got one of three responses. We can freeze and try to hide and try to just survive. We can fight back and be violent, or we can run, we can avoid it. So our brains are hardwired to see everything through threat or reward. It's, it's either a nice cow we can get a steak out of, or it's a T-Rex coming at us to, to destroy us. And, we are, and that part of our brain literally hijacks the rest of our brain and it works a thousand times faster. It processes information a thousand times faster than any other part of your brain. Here's, here's the interesting part. That part of your brain can't tell the difference between a physical threat and a social threat. It, it can't distinguish the difference. So you're responding to your wife correcting you like you would a T-Rex coming to devour you. Because your brain just is experiencing, this is a threat, you're being attacked, you're being attacked, and it's firing, and it's triggered, and it's actually called a amygdala hijack, because that part of your brain hijacks the rest of your brain, takes over, and says, we're going to avoid this, we're going to be violent and fight this, or we're going to... Um, we're going to just hide and, and be silent and be still and try to hide and just survive this. Your, your brain's working like that. And so in my situation, I happened to be at my daughter's eighth grade basketball game. Um, it was the first game after Christmas break. We were getting destroyed by the other team. And I didn't care about that. I didn't care about that at all. But I'm, I'm, we're sitting just a few rows behind the bench. I'm watching the coach interact because I've coached, you know, I'm... I'm a man of wisdom and great experience when it comes to coaching, and I, I know better than anyone else in the world how to handle eighth grade girls in this situation, and I know what I would do, and this is a great opportunity to build character. This is a great opportunity to pull all of your girls aside and say, look, forget the scoreboard. It's not about the scoreboard. It's about giving your best effort. It's about getting out there and becoming, this is where you show character. This is where you show who you are. Don't you quit. Don't you give up. That's, that's what I would have done. That is not what the coach was doing. The coach was not coaching the girls on the floor, at least from my perspective. Let me go back and say, this is all from my perspective. He would have a much different perspective if he were here. He was not coaching the girls. He's complaining about the refs. Who cares about the refs? You're getting beat 60 to two. It doesn't matter what the refs are doing at this point. It's not their fault. He's grabbing about them. He's talking to the assistant coach. He's sitting down. He's fiddling his thumbs. He's grabbing at the other girls. He's not even in. And then, whew, see, I'm already, I'm already feeling it. The need to bring correction. Halftime comes. Let's pull the girls in. Let's rally them. Let's give them a, come on, coach, give them a great pep talk. He walks over to the table where the score table is. We don't even need a halftime. Just start the clock. Let's get the third quarter going. And by that time, my amygdala hijacked the rest of my brain. And I became what some would call maybe a little overly aggressive. <laughs> and I decided that right now, in front of the entire Jim, that this would be the appropriate time to bring correction to the coach and tell him. And I said something that wasn't, I didn't cuss. Okay. At least I didn't cuss. Um, like some would have, um, I've got family members that would have cussed. Um, but I didn't cuss. I, mean, I, I just, I just firmly told him that his approach to coaching was in, inappropriate and inaccurate and may have called him a coward at one time. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> And what I quickly learned is that there wasn't any relationship here for me to bring some healthy correction because it wasn't healthy. It wasn't helpful. I embarrassed him. I humiliated my kids. My, my daughter's like, dad, please shut up. Please stop. Please. Like, he's going to coach me in a couple of years. You're ruining my life. Um, and I was just in, and what he did, he wasn't silent. He didn't avoid. He got violent and we went at it right there in the gym. 
And finally we got it shut down. They finished the game. I went over to him after the game. I did apologize. I did, I did apologize and say I, that was inappropriate. I shouldn't have done that. Wrong time, wrong place. But I still tried to bring some correction. <laughs> and he tried to bring correction to me. And it just wasn't working <laughs> because you can't bring healthy and helpful correction when there's not a healthy relationship. Because when you try to correct someone outside of cultivating a relationship where they know your motive, they know your intent, they know your heart, they know your care, it just comes across as you're personally attacking me. You're trying to wreck my life, not help my life. And so we have to do the work to cultivate a healthy relationship with the people in our life so that one when they make mistakes, we can step into their life and help bring correction. But more importantly, we need people around us that we have a relationship with and that we trust that when we make a mistake, they can step into our life and they can bring correction to us. Because I don't know if you know this or not, you need correction. Every single person in this room needs to be corrected. Look with me at Galatians chapter six, verse one. And it says, dear brothers and sisters. In other words, I'm referring to a family. I'm talking to a community of people that have done the work that brother and sister is not just a religious title that we've given each other. It's talking about and representative of the, rep of the relationship that we've cultivated. That there's a brotherly and sisterly relationship. There's been something cultivated. There's been something worked on. There's been relationship built here. And out of this relationship, it says if another believer, if one of the people in your community that you have relationship with, is overcome by sin. Sin means to miss the mark. They're not living the life God created them to live. They're not living it the way God created, it to, created them to live it. You who are godly, you who are mature, you who have a deep relationship with God and a deep relationship within the context of this God, Jesus community, should gently and humbly, I think those are relational terms, the Bible says that, that God leads us to repentance, leads us to change by his kindness, not his anger, not his aggression, not his violence, not his strength, not his force, but by his kindness. And he's telling us here, you're to reflect that. So when people in your community that you have a relationship with, when they stumble, when they make a mistake, you should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. You should bring correction into their life and help them course correct. Why? Because they're getting off and missing the mark of how God wants them to live. And when they do that, how many of you know when you take a wrong turn, you end up in the wrong place? So sometimes we need to course correct. We need to bring and we need people in our life that can help us gently and humbly bring correction to that. Verse two says to share each other's burdens. That we're to, to walk this life with each other and to carry each other's burdens, to support each other, to love each other, and in this, obey the law of Christ. There's a phrase that I love that I heard years and years and years ago that rules without relationship creates rebellion. Rules without relationship creates rebellion. And this is something that Kim and I took very, thankfully we heard this before we had kids. We took this very, very importantly because as you look at, at Scripture, God is not a God of rules. He's a God of relationship. Yes, there are rules. Yes, there are the Ten Commandments. Yes, there is the Mosaic Law. Yes, there are some laws and some rules and some things. But God always precedes the rules with relationship. You see God over and over and over again talking to his people. Hey, remember, you were in slavery. And what did I do? I brought you out of slavery. I heard your cry and I brought you into freedom. Hey, remember when you were in the desert and you were hungry and you were thirsty? What did I do? One, I was there with you. Two, I brought you food. I, I made sure you had water. I made sure that your needs were met. I protected you from your enemies. I gave you direction in a place that you were unfamiliar with. And so he's continually talking about and pushing the relational aspect of what he's done for them. 
And he's saying, I am with you. I am for you. I mean, there's all kinds of pictures and metaphors of God talking about relations. The rules always came after the relationship because when there's relationship, you know the answer to those three questions that I taught you a couple of weeks ago. Can you help me? Can I trust you? And do you really genuinely care about me? The answer is yeah. And, and we see that with God. And so Kim and I adopted that. And when we raised our, our children, we started really young, two, three, four years old. All of our girls are teenagers now. We've got one that just graduated high school. And the work that we did in those early years has laid the foundation for the relationship that we have now. And we would tell them, I would, I would set them down and just in different, when op doors opened and when things, listen, listen, I want you to know something. Mom and dad really love you. You know that, right? Yeah. I mean, when they're two and three, you're like superheroes to them. You're like, and so I'm like, I want to tell you some things before you think I'm stupid. Um, I, I want, before you become a teenager and you figure everything out, I want to sow some deep seed into you now. And so, man, you, you know that we love you, right? Yeah. You know that every decision that mom and dad make, when it comes to you, it's, it's because we believe it's the best. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And so we would just drive that home. Listen, listen, one day. You're not going to agree with the decision that we make. One of these days, you're going to want to do something. One of these days, you're going to want to go somewhere. One of these days, you're going to want to buy something. And we're going to tell you no. And I want you to know, you're not going to understand it. You're not going to agree with it. But I just want you to know, every single decision we make is because we believe it's the best decision for you, for your life, and for your future. Listen, I want, you to, I want to tell you something about our family. We're, we're Christians. We love Jesus. And because we love Jesus and because we have a relationship with Jesus, that puts boundaries on how we live. And there's going to be things that we do that other people don't do. There's going to be things that we don't do that other people you go to school with and you're friends with and their families do this and their families go here. We're not going to do that. And you're not going to always understand that. But just remember, we love you. We're for you. We're committed to your good. Listen, you're going to make mistakes. But there's nothing that you can do that's ever going to make mom and dad feel differently about you. And we drove this into them. We drove this into them. Every chance we had, two years old, three years old, four years old, five years old, six years old. So much so that we're having a, a corrective conversation with one of our daughters last week. And she, we're bringing some adjustments and some things. And she says, I know, I don't understand this, but you love me and you're for me. And I was like, yeah, you got it. Yes, we, we did the work because they understood. It's about the relationship. And when you've done the work to cultivate the relationship and they know the motives of your heart, it lays the groundwork now for someone to bring healthy and helpful correction. It's impossible to do that outside of the context of relationship. God showed us that he was committed to our good. God showed us that our lives bring him joy that we're wanted. And he's done the work to cultivate the relationship. And now, so now when he's done that and when we have a relationship with him, now he can step in to our life and bring correction. Hebrews says that because God loves us, God disciplines us. And his discipline, discipline, if you've ever experienced discipline or correction, it's not pleasant. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. It's not something you get excited about. It, it's painful. It's uncomfortable. But it's always for your good. Proverbs says a parent that refuses to discipline their kids hates their child. That's strong. That, that's a really strong word to parents that we have a responsibility and an obligation to bring correction into the life of our kids, that we're shaping them, that we're shaping their future, that we're shaping them. I've, I've seen some parents and I've wanted to lovingly bring some correction into the way and into their lack of correction. Because I'm like, you're raising a monster <laughs> if you don't step in and, and bring some, some correction to your children. If you don't teach them and, and shape them, and that's what correction does. It shapes us. It moves us away from dangers. Proverbs, the first few chapters, is full of, listen, please listen to the wisdom that's coming out of your mother's mouth, your, your father's mouth. It'll be life to you. When we embrace a life that is able to receive correction, 
We step into a life that can thrive and grow and become what God created us to be. You can't have healthy correction without healthy relationship. The second thing I want to tell you about correction, and listen, there's a laundry list of things that we could cover. There's ways on how to deliver correction. There's, there's principles on how to receive correction. There's so many things that this topic in and of itself, just this one message could be an entire series. But there's really a couple of things that I wanted to drive home. I've driven home the first. The second is that you can't bring correction where there isn't clear expectation. You can't effectively bring healthy and helpful correction where there hasn't been the work done to bring clear expectation. You can use that in parenting. You can use that in your marriage. You can use that in your business. You can use that principle anywhere in life. And God understood this. Look with me in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And it tells us something really important about how God established a clear expectation. Many of us look at the Old Testament. We look at the law. We look at what what is it about? Well, Romans 3 is going to tell us the purpose of the Old Testament law. It says in verse 19, it says, Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given. For its purpose, the purpose of the law, it's about to tell us, it's about to unlock this. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses. When there's not a clear expectation... There can always be excuses. Well, I didn't know that. I didn't know that that was wrong. I, I didn't know that that was a rule. I didn't, we, we had a clarifying conversation with, with one of our girls. She was like, well, I didn't know that I couldn't do that or that I had to do this. Well, well now the expectation is clear. So next time there's no excuse, correct? Absolutely. So now there's been a clear expectation and it says it, this, the law removed people's ability to have excuses and to show the entire world that it was guilty before God. In other words, the law's purpose defined sin and it made sin no. It, it, it set the expectation that this is how God expects us to live. This is, ex, this is how God expects us to handle relationships. This is how God ex, ex, expects us to handle business. This is how God expects us to do things in life. We are God's people. This is who we are. This is how we behave. And so the law is defining the expectation. And because of that, now Romans tells us that all have sinned, all have missed the mark, all have made a mistake, and all need to experience a relationship with Jesus, who is our Savior, who's the Redeemer of the fact that we've messed up and blown it. So it shows us our guilt, verse 20, for no one can be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The purpose of the law was not to give a pathway to self-earn or self-work to restore your relationship with God. It tells us, but the law simply shows us how sinful we are. It's the expectation, and God clarified the expectation. And now that we understand that we continually are missing the mark, we understand our need for Jesus to forgive us, to redeem us. He paid the price for our sin. And so within this context that you can't bring correction without clear expectation, what that tells me is that potentially what Shane preached last week was the most important message in this entire series. Because what he did is he defined who we are as a people. He he defined who we are as a church family. What we've been trying to do throughout this entire series of, of Good Ground is to really explore what is needed for us to be a church family that has the right ingredients so that when Psalms 92 happens and people plant their life, their family, their marriage in this church, that the, the correct things needed for them to grow are here, are present. And last week, Shane talked about who we are as a people. Because listen, this is so important because if we don't know who we are, we don't know how we're supposed to behave. We don't know the expectation. We don't know what, what's going on. We're not sure where, where it is. Where, where can I bring? If, if there's no expectation, how am I going to correct you? How am I going to adjust some things in your life? How is my life going to be adjusted if I don't know the expectation? And what Shane did was he created the expectation. He defined who we are as a people, which explains how we're going to behave. And one of the th- few things that he taught is that we're going to be a people that move. It's in the name of our church. We are church on the move. We are not church that sets still. We are not church of the stagnant. We are not church of the old and crusty and rusty and dusty. We we are people that move. 
We're, we're not going to be still because when you get still, you get stagnant. And when you become stagnant, you become toxic. And we're going to be people. And we're not just people that move randomly. We're not like a thousand chickens with our heads cut off that are moving in random directions. No, there's, there's certain directions that we're instinctively and intentionally moving towards. And the first one is that we're a people that move towards Jesus. We're going to be people that pursue Jesus. We're going to move in the direction of getting closer to Jesus. I need Cameron. Will you come here? Kelly, will you come here? I need two more. Can, can I borrow you? All right. You should sit on the front row. It's dangerous up here. Terry, can I borrow you? So, so come here. Um, I got, give them a hand as they come to the stage. Come quickly. All right. Let's see. All right. You, you stay there. Terry, my friend, come, come right here. Terry, my friend right here, he's going to represent Jesus. He looks a lot like Jesus, doesn't he? Um, I mean, in every picture I've seen, I, I think of your face. Um, no, kidding. But he's going to represent Jesus, so you stay right here, okay? My friend over here, what's your name? Sean? Pleasure, Sean. Glad you're here. My friend Sean, as handsome as he is, he's going to represent the exact opposite of Jesus. So he's evil. He's handsome evil, but he's evil, okay? Which I guess is kind of evil because evil's deceptive, and so you wouldn't expect. You know, you kind of look good, but you're evil. Um, and so he's, he's the exact opposite of the scale. So demonic, dark, just couldn't be further away from Jesus. He's, he's on that end of the scale. And so here's, here's here, come here, Cameron. You're, you're my favorite daughter this service. Um, <laughs> And so Cameron is really close to Jesus. She's grown up in church. Her parents taught her the word and taught her all of the, the Bible stories. She's memorized John 3.16. She can quote Jesus wept. You know, she's, she's, she's got the word down. She shows up to church. She serves. She's even serving in kids on the move every single weekend. She is like, you would think this woman is a woman of God. Okay. She's, she's stellar. My friend Kelly over here is not quite the same. She's, she's, she, she didn't grow up in church. She, you know, there's a lot of things we can say about Kelly that, that we won't say. None of it's true. I'm not prophetically calling anybody out this service, okay? Uh, this is all hyperbole and make-believe. But she's representing a person that's really, really far from Jesus, has no relationship with Jesus, really doesn't even care about the church, that, that, I mean, that, that most of her life. And, but she showed up on Easter. God really did something in her life. And, and, and I mean, there's something kind of moving. And what we do is, is we kind of like to compare on this scale of man, people over here are really close to Jesus. They need to be celebrated. Man, we ought to celebrate these kind of people. People over here, they, they really need to be corrected. I mean, we, we need to take some time. We need to really dig into their life, find out all their personal business, and, and show them their sin. And, and so we kind of yell at people that are here. But can I tell you, it doesn't matter where you are on the scale. That, that's not what we're comparing. That's not what we're judging. Because listen, it's very possible for you to be right here and you've gone to church for a long time. And man, you, you, know, you, you know the Bible, but there's something stale and stagnant in your relationship. And it doesn't matter where you're at on the scale because actually you can be right here and you can be facing this direction, 180 degrees away from Jesus. And what we know is that Jesus is always pursuing us. Jesus is always reaching out to us. Jesus is always tapping us on the shoulder, trying to get us to move in his direction. But there's some things in our We just get bored with church. We get bored with this God thing. You know, we get bored with prayer. We get bored with the intimacy. And, and here's what I know. It's not like we just sit still. We are constantly people that move. And we move in the direction that we face. And so if we're facing away from Jesus, our life is moving in this direction. We're moving away from Jesus. Now, on the outside, it looks like we're showing up to church. We're doing all these things. We're doing all the right stuff. But our life, we're not moving towards Jesus. But this person is far away. I mean, they, she, she, she went to the book of Job to find a job. Um, she just didn't know. But she's looking in the book of Job. And there's something. She's intrigued. She doesn't know the answer. She doesn't, she doesn't know how to pray. She still cusses when she comes into church. And I mean, it's, it's bad. But listen, she's 
facing this direction and she's moving towards this. And listen, this is the person that needs to be celebrated. This is the person that needs to be corrected because is your life moving towards Jesus? If it's not, I need to step into your life because I love you. I cherish you. You know that I value you because more than anything, I want you to turn around and I want you to be moving towards Jesus. Matter of fact, I want you to be a person that's reaching out to the Kellys and pulling them in the same direction that you're going. It doesn't matter how close to God you are, how far, it's what direction is your life moving. We are people that move towards Jesus. Amen. You guys can be seated. Thank you. That's who we are. And so because we've created that expectation, now that's the question in our relationships, in our small groups, in our community, in our friendships, when we're like, man, how are you doing? Is your life moving towards Jesus? Now, because we love each other, now because there's a clear expectation, now because we know in this community, we're not going to be perfect. I don't have to worry about all of the things in Kelly's life. I don't have to worry about all of the sin and all of the, she doesn't, hadn't figured this out and she doesn't have this tradition and she, did, she didn't know how to, she didn't know what the cracker and the juice was. She was excited because we got, she thought we were having wine at church, you know. We, I don't have to worry about correcting all of those things because if I keep her pointed towards Jesus, Jesus is going to work all of those things out. The Holy Spirit is going to point all of those things out. And as she gets closer to Jesus, she's going to look more like Jesus. She's going to act more like Jesus. And she's going to become more like him. And our community is going to become more like Christ the more we move in his direction. Amen? We need to celebrate the people that are moving towards Jesus because that's who we are. And we need to celebrate the people that have the courage to face their own issues. That's the second thing when we define who we are as a community. Yes, we move. Yes, we move towards Jesus. But we're also people that are humble enough to recognize I've got stuff. I've, I've got imperfections. I've got things I've got to deal with. And any person in this room, me included, that can't admit I have imperfections, it's going to be hard for you to move towards Jesus because the closer you get to Jesus, the more your imperfections begin to surface. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, he's in God's presence. And the first thing that's revealed to him is his imperfections. But as he keeps getting closer to Jesus, the imperfections are the very thing that Jesus touches and purifies. And so we've got to be people that are willing to face ourselves. That we're people that we're not just open to correction, we invite correction. We give people in our life permission. I want you that if you see something in me, you see something in my marriage, would you love me enough to correct me? Would you love me enough to bring it to my attention? Because I, I know I've got blind spots that I can't see. Before we, we did this series, um, before we started talking about good ground and all of this stuff, Ryan and I had sat down and I said, Ryan, I want to do what's called a 360 review. And I, I want to I give our staff an opportunity to bring correction into my life. I, I know that I'm flawed as a leader. I know that I've got things that I don't do that probably frustrate the team. There's probably things I was doing at the first of my time here that I'm not doing now, and maybe they want that back. But I, I just want to know from them. I want to give them space, a safe space. So we looked at the best way to do that, and through the, the month of June, I've got a one-on-one meeting with every one of our staff, with every one of our team, And it's not about their performance. It's not about what they've done right or what they've done wrong. It's just a space for them to say, hey, when you do this, it it makes my job harder. Hey, when you do this or when you say this or when you joke like this or whatever it is, they they may have three pages of notes. it's, It's not a meeting for them to come in and fluff me up and, oh, you're the best ever. No, it's really a space where I'm inviting and giving them permission, bring correction into my life. Help me be a better pastor. Help me be a better leader. 
Help me be a better follower of Jesus. And we're giving them space and inviting them. I've tried to do that with the people who lead me. I know positionally they don't need it, but I've just always gone to them and said, look, I want, to, I want you to know if I do something wrong, if I say something wrong, if I step out of bounds, I want, you don't need it because positionally you have it, you have the authority, but I just want you to know from me that you have permission to correct me. Well, what would happen if we became a church filled with people that were open and pursuing correction? That we were pursuing relationships with people that said, hey, will you, will you help me face some of the things in my life? Will, will you help give me accountability? Will you, will you help me? Be, because and, and here's, here's what I know and here's what I'm confident in. I'm not worried about any one of our staff me- meeting people walking into one of those meetings and personally attacking me. You know why? Because we have a relationship. Because I know that they love me. I know that they value me. I know that they care about me. I know and I believe that over the past year and a half, we've cultivated a relationship where I see that they're committed to my good. And I feel like they know that about me, that I'm committed to their good. And we're creating space for them just to to do that. And when you've done the work to cultivate a relationship and and a love and and you know that my life is valuable to you and and your life's valuable to me and you're committed to my good and I'm committed to your good and and we understand who we are as a people and we understand how we behave as a people and what the expectation is, now you can bring correction. Now we can pursue correction from people that love us. I'm not so inclined to take correction from people that I don't know love me, that are more critical of me. I'll, I'll listen because there's sometimes a grain of truth in every critique that I can learn from, that I can grow from. But the motive, the love, the care isn't there. But man, when I know people love me, it's easier. It's still hard. It's still not comfortable. I'm, not, I'm, not exci- I'm nervous about what they're going to say, but I'm not nervous about the way they're going to say it because I know they love me and they want to help me. Well, what if, what if we became that kind of church that said, hey, would you help bring correct? Would you help me face myself? We're people that face our issues. And the third thing really encompasses everything that I just said is that we're a people that move towards others. We're not going to be a church community that celebrates isolation. And we're not trying to create a, you can come and not be seen and not be known. We're trying to create a family here that is healthy for everybody. You're you're saying, well, man, my personality type is not that way. I'm intro- it's okay. We're, we're not going to try to put, you, put introverts in extroverted positions and expectations. We want you to be who you are, but you still need family. You still need relationship. You still need a relationship with someone that can bring correction into your life in a loving way, in a deep way, in a significant way that helps you keep moving towards Jesus, helps you keep moving towards those things where you're facing yourself, helps you keep moving. And so we're going to be a people that move towards others. Why? Because of what we said every single message in this series. Spiritual growth happens in Christ-centered relationships over a long period of time. If you're going to be the tree from Psalms 92 that grows and flourishes, you've got to be planted. Because seeds that are never planted will never grow. As long as you're moving from place to place and relationship to relationship and spiritual growth happens in Christ-centered relationships over a long period of time. Does that mean God's not ever going to move us? No, because God moves people from time to time. But when God moves you, he knows how to transplant you in a healthy way. And here's what he'll do. He'll transplant you from relationship to a God supernaturally significant relationship and community because spiritual growth happens in Christ-centered relationships over a long period of time. So what if we became a church that had what's needed for people to grow? What if there was genuine joy that when people walked in, our face lit up like God's face, that we we became the kind of people that could truly reflect God's character (laughs) and say, your life brings me joy. Well, what if we became a community that was really sincerely committed to each other's good and everybody had somebody that they could count on? What if 
We became a people that understood who we are together and developed a culture where we move towards Jesus. We move towards facing ourselves. We move towards others. What if we became that kind of community that moved in those directions? And what if we became the kind of people that built the relationships to where we could bring correction? That when one of us got off, stepped into a wrong relationship, stepped into a bad business deal, did something that missed the mark, we could lovingly, gently, humbly say, hey, I think you missed it there. Let, let me help you pull you back onto the right path. What, what if we became that kind of church? I think, I just think that we might become the kind of church where people could grow and become who God created them to be. We want more than anything to be good ground. Or when people walk in here, plant themselves, plant their families, they can grow, they can be inspired, they can be moved towards Jesus in an inspirational way, that they don't walk out those doors damaged and hurt. We're not perfect, we don't have this down, but we're trying to become that kind of place. Spiritual growth happens in Christ-centered relationships over a long period of time. Father, we thank you. Thank you for every person here. There's some of us in the room that we need correction. We need a course correction. We need, we maybe have not been on the right path. The thing that I would ask you today, every person in the room, Christian, non-Christian, struggling, successful, what direction is your life moving Are you the one that maybe you think you're good because you've just been close to Jesus but your life's pointed in the wrong direction? Which way is your life pointing? Which way is your life moving? Are you moving towards Jesus or away from Jesus? Because if you're moving away from him there needs to be a correction. There needs to be a turn. God's not upset, God's not mad, but God's reaching out with his kindness, with his love, with his compassion, just saying, hey, would you turn? I want you to come back towards me. Sometimes we make a mistake, we run from God, we run from God's people. And that's the exact opposite direction we should run. When we make a mistake, we get the privilege to run towards a gracious, merciful God who loves us unconditionally with an unfailing and unending love. So whatever it is you're dealing with, whatever it is that you've done, whatever direction you're facing, today God's just giving you the invitation. Would you turn and just move towards me? Nobody's looking around. We're not going to embarrass anybody. I'm just going to ask you to slip your hand up here in just a second and just have the courage to say, hey, I think my life's pointed in the wrong direction. And, and, I, and today I'm just... Raising my hand to signify I'm turning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move towards Jesus. I'm going to get some help facing some of the stuff in my life, some of the anger, some of the unforgiveness, some of the addictions, some of the things that are keeping me. I, I'm going to need some help facing some unhealthy relationships. that's you and your life's pointed the wrong direction, you're moving the wrong direction, would you just slip your hand up? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Anybody else? It takes courage. It takes boldness. Is it in your traditional, do you want to ask Jesus into your heart kind of call? This is for every person in the room. Well, Father, you see the hands. More importantly, you see the hearts. And I just thank you for this significant moment to where I say this is a turn. This is a turn to say I'm moving in your direction again. I'm going to take a step. I'm going to plant myself in Christ-centered relationships. And I'm going to surround myself with people that are going to help bring correction into my life. I'm going I'm to face some things, God, through the, the power of your Holy Spirit and As I grow closer to you, would you search me? Would you know me? Would you reveal the flaws and the offensive things in me that are keeping me distracted, that are keeping me moving in the wrong direction? Would you help me step into freedom? God, I just lift them up and I pray that they would experience your love, your grace, and your forgiveness. 
We honor you and we thank you for your faithfulness. That every time we make a mistake, every time we fall, you're there to pick us up. Your word says that a righteous man falls seven times, but he keeps getting up. I think that today is the day that some people get up. They get up. And maybe they'll fall again in the future, but they'll get up. And we keep moving towards you. I think that even the act of raising their hand was a step towards you. And God, you said in your word, as we draw near to you, you'll draw near to us. We honor you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.